Okay. Uh, Romanesque is a term that means Roman-like. It was coined in the 19th century to describe church architecture from about the 11th to 12th century. So it is basically a stylistic term, not an historical term. And it's meant to describe the time of simple, rounded, arched forms that we see in church architecture at this time. Um, basically, the periods that we're talking about around the year 1000, which is our easy to remember date for Romanesque, was a period where we start to see a shift in the prevailing economic system of the Middle Ages, which was basically feudalism. Feudalism was basically a system where a king owned the land, who and then leased it to a baron, who and then leased it to vassals, who would lease it then to lesser lords, who would then at the bottom of the chain would be the peasants that would then pay rent for the land and work it. So it was basically the ultimate kind of trickling up of all of this money uh, through the landed gentry uh, to the, you know, those that were in a position of power. What we start to see around this time is the breaking down of the system where we're going to see uh, individuals breaking away from their tenure on to the land and developing skills. Uh, a merchant class is going to develop and with it towns are going to form and a sense of trade will develop and a cash economy will emerge. This in turn will encourage the more uh, growth of towns and uh, a breaking away from the tie to agriculture as the only form of existence. Of course, what are these people going to do with the bit of money that they earn uh, in their trade as a merchant? Uh, they are going to go on religious pilgrimages uh, and travel to religious sites, uh, taking long, oftentimes dangerous journeys to venerate the remains of saints. Uh, this kind of pilgrimage was a means in which penitent Christians could atone for their sins, okay? And the pilgrimages to Rome, where we know the remains of uh, St. Peter lie, uh, was dangerous uh, to go to the Holy Land, even more dangerous. So we're going to see a mass interest in the remains of St. James, whose body was interred in Spain in, um, uh, in the, about the second century. Um, St. James, you'll remember, was one of the saints who was there at the Transfiguration. He slept through the whole thing. Uh, he is going to be martyred in Judea in 42, but his body will miraculously um, be moved to Spain, where it will then be uh, interned at Santo, Santiago de Compostela, where a large cathedral will be built uh, for, uh, uh, on his remains. This is going to be the favored site for pilgrimage for, for those living uh, in Western Europe. Okay, the pilgrims would oftentimes uh, wear the cockle shell of St. James, and there we can see uh, this image of one of these pilgrims, and carry a large staff which would assist them with the rigors of their journey, which as I said were very dangerous because there were many people laying on the road to wait for them, so they oftentimes would move uh, through groups. It was actually the relics themselves that had the power to help these individuals atone for their sin or become healthy or whatever uh, their um, need was uh, in taking on the pilgrimage. But the trick was they had to travel to the relic for it to work its power. If they ideally they would come up and then touch the relic, whether it be the bones of St. James uh, or the cloak of the Virgin or whatever, 
Uh, and if they couldn't touch it, then they could touch the reliquary or the box or the container in which the relic was placed. And thus they would gain power, they would kind of gather the power from the object that way. Okay? Uh, so here you can see that pilgrimage route, the route through Santiago, Santiago today is still something, is something that people do. It's called El Camino or the road. Uh, and people have been traveling it really since about the year 1000, even a bit before that. And as you can say, Maine, uh, this route was heavily traveled. And what we're going to see is churches springing up along the route to accommodate uh, the large amounts of tourists huh. I don't seem to be able to move my my PowerPoint presentation I wonder if it has to do with this. That's totally and totally annoying. Okay, and here is one of those large churches that are going to emerge on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. This is called saint Sernan. It is in Toulouse, France, and is a good example of a great pilgrimage church in that it could accommodate the large crowds of people uh, and was in a relatively isolated place. Uh, saint Sernan was built about 1070 and was part of a building campaign that spread across Europe at this time. Um, there basically is going to become an obsession with church buildings around 1000 and kind of like we experienced ourselves around the millennium, uh, people uh, became kind of more interested in pilgrimages and kind of religious uh, interests at the turn of the year 1000 just like we experienced at the year around 2000. Um, it here is a um, testament from a monk who was witnessing this furore of church building. Uh, he wrote, his name is Raoul Glaber, and he wrote this in his uh, text, The Historia, that was uh, dated to 1003. Uh, as, the year, as the third year that followed the year 1000 drew near, there was to be seen over almost all the earth, but especially in Italy and Gaul, great renewal of church buildings. Each Christian community was driven by a spirit of rivalry to have a more glorious church than the others. It was as if the world had shaken itself and cast off its old garments, had dressed itself again in every part in the white robe of churches. And this is uh, kind of a metaphor that is used widely in describing uh, this kind of campaign for church building around 1000. Saint Sernan, which was, uh, who was, basic, who was the, a bishop of Toulouse who was martyred, around 250 uh, had this and whose remains were placed there uh, has, is going to be built as I said around 1070 into this pilgrimage style church as you can see it's a basilica formed church much larger than what we've seen like at San, um, uh, San Bernard uh, with a large transept now extra wide uh, with a series of radiating chapels that come off the apse, which were an um, uh, uh, area to um, display the over 127 relics held in this church. Uh, they had been gifted most of these relics by Charlemagne and now built this extraordinarily huge structure to display them. Uh, you'll notice now the double aisles on either side. This allowed the pilgrimages to come into the church while the monks could be uh, performing rites associated with the liturgical calendar, move around just like we saw at St. Peter's without bothering them. Um, uh, this, uh, the churches were also expected to 
house any pilgrim that was coming through. They had an obligation to do this. So this would be a place that would actually offer be a, be a place where these pilgrims could stay the night uh, as they were moving through. If we look at the exterior, um, ex uh, we can see this kind of plain aesthetic, which is kind of part of the Romanist, central to the Romanesque church. I want you to ignore this tower on the crossing. That is a later Gothic uh, addition. Uh, the church itself is extremely plain f exterior with a series of small arched windows. This is how you can tell if a church is Romanesque because it's heavy, walls are very thick, and the arches are rounded. As we're going to learn tomorrow in the Gothic period, we're going to see uh, a movement towards more vertical orientation and the churches are basically higher. And uh, to achieve that, we're going to see architects are going to embrace the pointed arch rather than the rounded arch. And it's going to become much more ornate uh, and fancy in the subsequent uh, centuries. So this is very plain, very much, um, it gets the kind of name basically from the Roman structures like uh, the Colosseum, which we know is like a series of rounded arches. Unlike the Colosseum, this is built entirely of stone. As we know, the recipe for concrete has been lost. And one of the extraordinary aspects of this is that they are going to recreate um, aspects of buildings that the Romans are going to do with concrete here with stone. Yeah, Nancy, did you have a question? Well, kind of as we've seen, right, there is a, the predis, the, the um, precursing buildings, right, were functional buildings that had, uh, didn't have the kind of ornate exteriors like the temples did in the classical world. So it's kind of a continuation of that trajectory. What we're going to see in the Gothic is, and what we start to see in the Romanesque is they kind of leave that behind and they begin to embellish the exterior of the churches. They're going to start more humbly around the doors because this is where people access. But then by the Gothic, this kind of thing is left in the dust and there's going to be lavish uh, use of sculpture all around the exterior of churches including stained glass as a means of making these um, extraordinary inside and outside. Yeah. Always. That's always been part of it. It's, the, it's called cruciform, right? We saw that for St. Peter's to have that church turned into a cross with a transept aisle. That was an innovation of the Christians from that very early period, taking the basilica and turning it into a cross, right? Cruciform, cruciform, okay? We'll be able to, like, what kind of workers? Well, that's the thing. So basically what was going on was these churches were burning down right and left like St. Peter's burns down. And so what they decide to do to uh, mitigate the loss of church with fire is to cover the tr trust wooden roof with a stone vault. And so here we see the early Romanesque churches having here, what kind of vault, vault is this? This is a barrel vault, right? A barrel vault that springs off the ceiling, right? Uh, off the wall that we're seeing here. Um, the, uh, what they're going to develop is the ability to basically make these vaults with ashlar blocks uh, rather than with cement. And this is going to take a very skilled set of masons who are going to emerge during the Middle Ages, who are going to carefully protect and preserve their know-how and that are going to move from site to site building these churches. Um, this is, um, they are going to move with architects. Uh, they're kind of one and the same for the most part who are going to design these. Their only instrument being the compass is their kind of technology that they use. 
um, in the forming of these churches and it is an extraordinary uh, leap in um, uh, stone work here and it's going to be very much kind of a emerge and continue to almost be almost a secret society in the way they're going to preserve their knowledge and their ability to do these kind of structures. Yeah. Yes, this is of course where the Freemasons are going to come from, okay? Uh, and uh, many of these buildings, we're going we're gonna, to uh, talk about this tomorrow in terms of Gothic architecture, have kind of special symbolic relevance related to kind of Christian ideas. Yeah, Kathy? This? That area? This? Oh, this? Oh, I'm sorry, here? What, this? I'm sorry. On the floor and the ceiling. This is the apse, right? So we can look at the plan. Here we're looking at the apse, right? Down the barrel of the, of the nave, okay? And now here we're looking at the apse, okay? And we see the light coming in from the radiating chapels. And these, like uh, any of the ancient structures, these have been worked on over time. Okay, so different kind of um, uh, kind of innovations have been made uh, through time. Typical of a Romanesque church, we see these very heavy, substantial piers. Okay, holding up the church with very thick um, and heavy for their extraordinary weight-bearing function. Uh, we see typical a colonnade level of the church, a kind of course of colonnades. And what we see here is an engaged column on, t on the top of this pier. This is called a compound pier. Because of the extra lateral thrust of these massive vaults, right, the, the desire for them to move outward, to thrust sideways, they are going to come up with the innovation of adding a, um, a gal, um, a, um, uh, they are called, uh, uh, I'm blanking on this, they are called uh, tribune gallery, a tribune gallery here or a second story which is going to help them to uh, support this uh, uh, transverse arch, okay? And I don't want to bog you down with a lot of this kind of architectural stuff, I, especially with our s speedy class, okay? Uh, so what I want you to understand is in typical of Romanesque churches, we see this barrel vault, right? Uh, we see a um, compound pier, that means we have this engaged column on this big, huge, weight-bearing pier and this transverse arch leaping across. The effect is that the nave is not one continuous hall, but rather kind of a series of bays. These are bays which give it a processional characteristic as we move through section by section through the church, okay? Uh, this is typical of the barrel vaulted Romanesque church. Okay? In the Romanesque period, we see them, oh, and here we can see, um, I compare it to St. Michael's, where we see above this, interesting, is a wood trust roof. Okay? Um, and now they've just basically created a large uh, stone vault underneath it. They are going to get more intricate during the Romanesque period. And here I am showing you Saint Etienne, which is the Norman church in France. And a lot of this innovation is going to take place in France. Uh, this is going to be the region, the Norman area is the region of northern French coast, which is going to be settled by the Vikings, whose um, successors are going to be called the Normans. They basically are going to, um, the Normans are going to uh, 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 raid uh, the English, uh, Great British Isles and are going to successfully take them in, around this time, around uh, 
the 11th century and they're going to take their architectural innovations with them. Saint Etienne is another good example of the Romanesque style of architecture, church architecture. And we can see here though, they are going to make a more complicated vaulting system in the nave of this church. Similarly, we have these very thick walls that are holding and supporting these huge piers. We see our colonnade, right, the base level, with a compound pier from which springs a ribbed transverse vault, okay? And as you can see here, different than the barrel vault of saint sernin we see now the use of a series of growing vaults, okay? You see the growing vaults, and the effect is, right, kind of a, a ceiling that looks taller, more vertical. And what we're going to see in the course of the next century is this desire for ever higher, more vertical churches until in the next Gothic period, they're going to get almost ridiculously high and vertical and are going to orient themselves towards verticality by embracing the pointed arch rather than the rounded form. So an easy way to identify a Roman S church is to look for the rounded arch forms throughout, okay? So similarly to saint Sernan, we get this kind of processional quality where each section is now, this is not to confuse you, it's called a six partite vault because we have these six sections of the vault, but these basically um, growing vaults that make these individual bays, okay, to be getting a different set of vaulting systems. And this is extraordinary technical innovations that is made possible by the know-how of these masons that are able to kind of create these very complicated uh, vaulting systems with stone alone, okay? I promise uh, this will become more clear tomorrow. What this means when using a growing vault is that they are able to add now a new third story to the walls of the buildings. We have the colonnade. We have now that tribune gallery, which is like a second floor balcony where you can go up there and look down. But now here they've added the clear street or the row of windows in there, which is going to allow these churches to be more light filled which is all relative because anyone that's ever been into even a Gothic cathedral like Notre Dame knows that it's still quite dark inside, okay? Uh, but it's all relative, this is still lighter. And this is almost a um, uh, misleading photo of saint Sernin because it looks so light-filled. Uh, it's actually darker in saint Sernin than it is in saint Etienne. When we look at the exterior of Saint Etienne, we see typical of a Romanesque church. Forget the uh, spires on the top; those are a Gothic later addition. Okay, and you can see clearly the difference between them and the Romanesque, which is extraordinarily plain. Right? Uh, we basically here uh, see a very well organized facade broken down into three string courses. Okay, the three. Portions of the exterior reflect the three stories one finds inside, okay? So this is uh, very typical of the, um, uh, the Gothic or the Romanesque to have the kind of, um, the exterior will reveal what's on the interior. Uh, we see here the facade then, not only do we see these three courses, we see it divided into three by these four buttresses on the exterior, right? So three sections. This in turn is divided, the towers above are divided into three sections as well. So we have the kind of continuity of threes and of course we know the symbolic relevance of three in Christianity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity at the center of uh, Christian uh, doctrine. Furthermore, we see the three small arched windows in the front, okay? It's very, very plain, uh, very, very simple, uh, but uh, symbolically relevant. 
the Normans are going to take their innovations that we see in San Sernan, that use of the growing vaults and the ribbed vaulting system with them to England when they conquer. And perhaps here is the most famous of Romanesque churches. Churches. This is called Durham Cathedral, uh, which um, dates to about the 11th century. Uh, it is found in England and is kind of a highlight of Romanesque architecture. Uh, we see here uh, a similar uh, vaulting system as in San Sernan. Uh, however, uh, they have now included a bit of a pointed arch in the vaulting system, uh, which we can see here in this rib. Uh, the arch to the apse, however, is rounded. This is still considered to be a Romanesque church, even though we see here the, the now uh, uh, more simple, more effective vaulting system above. We see the three levels on the side. This is I bring this to your attention because when we get to the Gothic, they're going to add another level uh, in their search for ever higher uh, church naves. Uh, we see the colonnade, we see the tribune gallery, we see the clerestory here. What's so unique and f fantastic and uh, idiosyncratic about Durham, of course, is the fantastic piers and the way they have been decorated. Uh, we see these extraordinary patterning here. We see the chevron design. Um, that uh, kind of inverted V that's uh, presented over and over again, uh, and another pattern design here. These, of course, reference the indigenous tradition that we see coming from uh, the art of the barbarians uh, here, kind of fused into uh, Christian architecture. Uh, look out for these uh, in movies or whatever. This is used widely um, by set designers. Um, for referencing the Middle Ages, uh, these uh, chevron designs. Yeah, Sam? This is a, the Masons would be doing this. And these, would, these were brightly painted as well. There was, it's not as clear like as we think of it today, you know, oh, there's the, the difference between kind of the architect and the, en the civil engineer and then the craftspeople. The craftspeople were highly skilled uh, and um, were capable of using kind of architectural ideas and uh, even con uh, conferring and, and assisting with the, with the plans. Uh, exactly who the architect was. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the bishops would take you know, credit for being the architect of a cathedral. The whole idea of kind of an artisan, an artist, is very different than we know today. This is still a bunch of anonymous people you know, working, no one really knows, uh, and those in power basically took credit for what was done. No, these are not slaves. Masons are not slaves. Yes, they were building it. They were building it. And it was a very specialized uh, knowledge that they kept. It was a, protected by a guild system that they uh, protected uh, and kind of passed down one generation to the other. Not dissimilar to what we saw, you know, Danny talking about in the bronze casting tr um, world. Yeah. Um, well, not many buildings are really constructed like this today. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm not an engineer, but um, they do know lots about it. We're going to watch this extraordinary video tomorrow where they, they now use computers to, like, scan the entire buildings, and they know exactly where, there's, where they went wrong. Uh, it's extraordinary that they were, what they were able to accomplish with just, you know, the most basic uh, technological tools you know, plumb lines is what they would use to make sure things were straight. You know, literally the compass being their main um, tool in the rendering of these plans. They did build elaborate models um, to construct these, and we'll we'll kind of talk, get more into that uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Geometry. No, um, to my, the level of math, I'm not sure, but I know that geometry was central to this, and that these um, 
and that the, that the use of kind of geometry had not only kind of a mathematical component, but was also understood as having spiritual meaning as well. So there was a con con comb combination between the two. It wasn't like we have like math over here and Christianity over here. It was kind of conflated into two things. Like the school, you know, they, the, the, everything had a meaning beyond just its functional meaning. Like by using like three, you know, and a lot of, we'll talk about this, like the, um, a lot of it was based on like the, the, the Temple of Solomon as described in the Bible as a series of ratios that was then incorporated into various cathedrals later on. Okay, so uh, it was very much a religious practice, and I think that the architects saw themselves as religious. Okay? Um, I want to talk about the development in Italy of this um, use of the stone vaulting systems. This was a period of great travel, so it's not surprising that we go to Italy and find uh, stone vaulting there. Here is San Ambrogio in Milan. Uh, we can see the uh, use of the stone vaulting system. Uh, here is a rib, right, uh, ribbing the arch form and then the growing vaults uh, to the side. It looks very different than we see in Durham and San Etienne because it's a much lower squatter church. Uh, there's not that e uh, emphasis on verticality in the south like there is in the north. It's much kind of uh, closer to the ground. Of course, this is the uh, region of the world where the early Basilican church first emerged. Uh, and so we're going to see kind of a closer connection with the uh, previous tradition uh, in Italy than we see uh, certainly in the north. But there is kind of continuity between the two. Uh, here is the plan of San, Ambro um, San Ambrogio. You can see how long uh, and odd it looks compared to the large uh, transverse. Uh, the transept is non-existent. If we, but however, if we look from the top here down, we can see that use of the brick exterior, very similar to the likes of um, the mausoleum of Santa Blasidia, the Byzantine tradition, which remains strong uh, in Italy. And we're never going to see them go as high as we see them go in the north. Yes? Um, this combines two. <laughs> I know it does. Many churches, there's also anything you want you can find at UCLA. You can find Romanesque, you can find Gothic, you can find Byzantine inspired architecture. And that's not true just at UCLA. You can find that at many of the UCs. Yeah, it's really fun. And now that you're kind of aware of these to say like, oh yeah, the Gothic building, which I think is like the Hall of Records, and then the, the libraries or USC also uses a lot of brick like this as well. So uh, yes the kind of revival of various styles is uh, popular in campus, college campuses as it is here at our campus, right, uh, with the use of the classical. Um, in Italy also we have the tendency to break away the churches where we have uh, Campanile or the bell tower is a separate building than the actual uh, church or the cathedral. Uh, here is the baptistry of San Giovanni, which is in Florence. Uh, uh, the baptism or the area for baptism is oftentimes uh, placed separately than the rest of the church, as is the case here. Baptism has a large role in Florence because their patron saint is St. John the Baptist. And here is the Romanesque baptistry, which you can see right away is influenced by what? And Florence, of course, is in Italy, in Tuscany. Uh, yeah, Yang Fen. No, you're right. What do you think it reminds you of? Yeah, definitely very. This is a Romanesque building, but good. You're looking at the arch form. Yeah, Nancy. Yeah, it's central plan, like Santa Costanza, right? Also. Uh, the kind of domed component here is not dissimilar to even the Pantheon of Rome, these large, or San Vitale, these large central plan churches, which we see all around Italy. 
So it's not surprising then that we would see a continuation of that in the Romanesque. Uh, what is idiosyncratic to this period is the way, and Yang Fen noticed this right away, the use of the arch form, the repetition of you know three forms, also the way they use this um, beautiful locally mined marble, uh, that green color, uh, to make this pattern on the exterior. Yeah, it's beautiful. And then, of course, they're going to use and match it to the cathedral that is going to be built later during the Renaissance period. So if you've been lucky enough, he's been to Florence and seen this, you hang out the baptistry and then the entire cathedral is this extraordinary kind of stri striped effect of this deep green and the um, uh, kind of uh, earthen color. Uh, of the stone make this dramatic effect. Uh, and this, you know, organization, the outline of the different elements of uh, the building, very much part of the Romanesque. Yes? This building has three doors. And so I invite you to take the 1B because we talk long and hard about these doors, uh, including, of course, this door which is the most famous of doors, known as the Gates of Paradise, so called by Michelangelo, because they were so beautiful that they would work well as the Gates of Paradise. And of course, you'll recognize they are bronze. They are influenced by Bishop Bernward's bronze doors at Hildesheim. And these doors are particularly going to be influential because they will basically be accredited with kicking off an artistic revolution that is known to us as the Renaissance. Okay? Um, I'm not done yet. We're going to talk about the decoration of these churches. Okay? This is, so we've talked about kind of the architecture of the Romanesque, these kind of rounded arch forms, and now I want to talk about the way these, the artwork of the Romanesque period, which not surprisingly is going to be addressed to the churches themselves. And here is a magnificent painted ceiling in the barrel vaulted nave of saint -Sur savant sur gartemp uh, in France, where we see uh, along the uh, nave uh, ceiling here in the vault scenes from the Old Testament, uh, which would then lead to the apse where one would find bright paintings of New Testament figures. Uh, and because those are in a bad state of repair, we're going to switch around and look at an apse painting from Santa Maria de Mur in Spain from the 12th century. Here we see uh, the kind of uh, painting, uh, fresco work from these churches where we see Christ the Pancreatur or Christ the Judge who is here in the act of judging the world in a mandala, reminding us, does this remind us of anything? Stylistically, yeah. Yeah, right, this is very Byzantine, right? And I'll remind you that the Byzantine artists around 800 came flooding out of Byzantium to um, escape the iconoclasm and are going to work their influence, particularly in Spain, and we see it here, uh, a very Byzantine-inspired uh, apse painting, Christ in the middle in the act of judging, and then around him we have the symbols for the four gospel writers, Matthew, uh, the man, Mark is symbolized by the lion, uh, Luke, by the ox and the um, kind of esoteric John by the soaring eagle who we see here. Well, we see some fresco paintings like this, by far and away the most uh, widely um, seen art form of the Romanesque period is sculpture. And this is not surprising, this is the great age of the mason artisan. Uh, and here is a lentil from Saint-Genis-des-Fontaines in France dating to the 11th century 
where we see, uh, in order to kind of wrap our head around this, we need to learn a little bit of vocabulary. Uh, it's going to be these doorways that are going to be most elaborately decorated. Uh, and this is the lentil panel uh, from this door. And here is the lentil we see here, right? So you enter in the two doors. In the middle between the doors, this section is called the trameau, OK? And then the most important decoration would appear here in the tympanum above the door. And then during the Gothic period, they're going to get fancier and fancier. And we're going to see these um, areas are going to be uh, decorated all around the door. The jams are going to be decorated, and the voissoirs and so forth, uh, more and more elaborate. But during the uh, Romanesque, it's mostly this section here. Uh, here we see uh, recognizable uh, iconography of Christ the Judge, once again, very Byzantine uh, in the way it looks, uh, very flat. Also, we see angels poking out on either side. Next uh, to either side of Christ, we see the symbol of the Alpha and the Omega. This is Jesus' uh, claim to be both the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And then on either side, we see uh, individuals waiting to receive his judgment. I want you to take, I make this comparison here between uh, the figure of Christ on the left from this jam, uh, from the lentil, with the uh, pa page from the Lindisfarne Gospel. So you can really see a sense of continuity in terms of design aesthetic. Not only is this coming from the Byzantine tradition, which the flatness, but we see it also, right, in the West as well. Uh, this kind of emphasis on li the linear qualities, uh, n no real uh, connection to corporeality uh, and kind of um, Also, this um, patterning effect that we see, um, kind of this transference from the very different design aesthetic or the, the, the different um, media of the book arts here to uh, sculpture. And of course, these were you know, read by illiterates as stories. Uh, and there was a kind of connection between Jesus as the door to heaven uh, and the uh, embellishment of doors from this period. Uh, by far and away, the most lavishly decorated Romanesque church uh, was uh, Saint-Pierre at Moisac in France. This was on that pilgrimage route to Saint, uh, uh, Santiago de Compostela. And here we see uh, an elaborate decoration of Christ, uh, the judge, the favorite motif. We're going to see in the Gothic period, they're going to move away from this manifestation of Christ. Um, we're going to see uh, less kind of judgment um, uh, imagery. And we're also going to see a more educated population as well. Uh, and here he's accompanied by 24 elders who look up at Christ. Uh, these are figures who are described in the book of Revelation, uh, which was uh, widely read during this period uh, with this fascination with judgment. Uh, we look at the elders as they, they are carved uh, in high relief. Uh, they are very elongated in form. This is typical of Romanesque uh, figural representation. Uh, as they look up at Christ in that kind of mandala, judging the world. And then uh, below the trumeau at Mozak, uh, we see this extraordinary rendering uh, of an Old Testament prophet, uh, perhaps a Jeremiah or Isaiah, um, kind of a very uh, beautiful uh, and interesting uh, from the waist down. Uh, he has been stretched or elongated significantly. This is, of course, to fit him into that long space of the trumeau, but also gives him an almost otherworldly uh, quality, uh, as we see his long, extenuated legs. Uh, on the front of the trumeau are lions, and of course, um, 
Grace, you already made the connection between the lions at the door. Here we have that long connection with lions at the at the gate, lions here uh, protecting uh, the entranceway of the church uh, with this extraordinary um, figure uh, looking down at the passerby. And these, of course, have a didactic function meant to help people to identify figures, biblical figures, and stories. I know, isn't that ironic? Okay, so we're out of time, so more on this tomorrow, and we'll get into uh, Gothic architecture as well.